I'm back here with another New Scott interview, and I'm here with the big pitcher Chris Cook. Yeah. And is this the first interview you've first ever time. done? First time. It only took 12 years, New Scott. <laughs> You're a busy guy. You had to, you had to catch up. Yeah, real busy. <laughs> Uh, were you a fan of professional wrestling growing up? Not growing up. Actually, I first time I recall seeing wrestling, I was likely, I don't know, seven years old, and it was WWF, and it must have been a few between Bret Hart and Stone Cold, and they were in Canada. <clears throat> and I remember the Hearts were singing the national anthem, and then Austin came out. It was like 1997. Was that nice? Yeah. So I would have only seen just that clip. That was it. And then I didn't watch wrestling until 2001. One time when I was grounded, oddly enough, I was allowed to watch TV. <laughs> and the first match I ever seen was on SmackDown. It was Bubba Ray Dudley against Kurt Angle. Random how I know that. Angle was the champion. What, uh, when you first got into it, who did you enjoy watching the most? Oh, The Rock. The Rock? To this day, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Still? Definitely. What, uh, and what was it about professional wrestling that when you decided to get trained, that it was, what was it about it that uh, you thought you could do it? Um... Ooh, it's hard. I don't know. It just I remember like being young and after I don't know four months of watching it, I was like, how do they do that? Like I knew I knew that it was a work, but I wanted to know how it was a work. So I kind of was you know practicing with a buddy, and then I was like, okay, this would be fun to try. And also the other part that really intrigued me was the crowd involvement. Like I love the whole being able to get a group of people to react certain ways and have their emotions like. I just like I love the showboat part of it. And uh, how did you go about find? You wrestled before you were trained. Yeah, I, I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it. It's like Everybody opening that done. dark door to yeah. the truth. So when what I made you think that that was a good idea, like what what was going through your head? I just wanted to try it. Yeah. Like uh, the whole like storylines and characters and gimmicks and everything like that. I was like, this would be fun. I remember sitting down with two of my best friends growing up, and we would literally write out like. We wrote out our characters and everything, like a signature move, finisher move, and then wrote the storyline for what we were going to do. And then we collected, this is embarrassing to say, we went around in spring cleanup and collected mattresses, and then we'd store them in a shed and basically made an area that you could land on and take the moves on outside of my dad's house. And he had like the old school, remember, it's like a... When there'd be two channels, you could get like ATV and Global. Without or, cable? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or it was MTV at the time, I think. Not MTV. Uh, what was it, was it called? It was before Global. Yeah, I do know what you're talking about. So uh, he had this... ASN? There was an ASN? Yeah, the, I think that... Anyways, yeah. it was an antenna <clears throat> that went up the side of his house, but it was like a triangle ladder. So we always positioned our mattresses around there, so we had a top rope to do the moves <laughs> off of. I didn't go up there, but... And anyways, yeah, we just kind of pieced it together and went from there i shouldn't even say it because like the kids that would watch this but yeah. like i remember we used to have seven eight guys would come over and we'd have a whole show put together where actually people from the community would come with lawn chairs some of them some of those shows happened here in the building yeah, yeah. we're in tonight no this is before that this is before this that. is like three years before okay. like i was like, like 12 13 so what, years old what year was this how old were you 2002 oh okay 2001 okay. 2002 yeah, I remember I came here to a show in like 2005 or 2006. RCW. Yeah, River yeah. City Wrestling. I still yeah. got the t-shirt. Were you on that show? I don't think I knew uh, So I went to I RCW. I remember Jason Holiday and, and Sexton Phoenix were on there as different names. Yeah. At least Troy was. Jason, uh, Tommy Scowl and Vincenzo Spinelli. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I got like the memory for all that's the old a, stuff. So I used to... <laughs> back to these mattress days. So we put everything together and I remember like one summer I worked for my stepfather and he was a farmer. So I did all his farming work in exchange he built me a ring instead of actually paying me. So then all of a sudden at 13, 14 years old we had a ring in my backyard and we would practice and it, it was a decent ring. The rope sucked but I mean it was a solid bump and everything like that. And then I seen posters for RCW which was the local... Jason Holiday was the promoter, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember I went to a show, I met Murph afterwards, and I literally was 14 years old and said I wanted to wrestle, and 
Murph at the time was a dick. And he was like, yeah, whatever, kid. You're too fat. Get out of here. <laughs> it was his answer to a 14-year-old. You're too fat. Get out of here. So anyways, I kept messaging him on MSN at the time. Somehow I got his MSN. I think I emailed like the RCW Hotmail account saying I wanted to wrestle. And then he ended up adding me. So he told me <clears throat> to come to a show early. I went down to a show early, helped him set up the ring, which the turnbuckles were telephone poles. Which is awesome. <laughs> And there's two ropes, and he taught me how to bump. Two ropes? Two ropes, awesome. and, and it was like, they weren't tight. Was this the ring that had all the tires underneath it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it was <laughs> the telephone poles with four sills that were built exactly how you would frame a floor. Yep. And they would all fit inside, uh, I don't even know what the frame was then, because he redid the frame years later. Yep. But yeah, there'd be two transport truck tires in the middle. <sighs> that was the spring for the bump. So anyways, he, he taught me how to bump. It likely took him three hours, and my bump likely sucked. And then... Uh, I got beat around, but not like in a bad way. Like he just made me bump and front bump, which was the shits at the time. And I think I was a year going to his shows, just setting up the ring. And you know, like even though it was backyard, it's kind of like he was in with mainstream at the time. So yeah. I think he knew how guys broke into the business. Yeah. So like even though it was a backyard thing, which I know is no credibility, but he still kind of had those principles with me. And then. I did a couple shows, but it was like I was in squash matches against a guy named Cuckoo Kalu. And he did a show in Cole Harbor. Were you there? It was at a church in Cole Harbor. Probably. Guys. There were so many. Yeah, you were many definitely there. there. It would have yeah. been from local guys. It would have been me, Troy, and Steve. Yeah. It would have been the only guys that were like. Steve Arsenal? Yeah, yeah. That were on that show. And then. What happened? Uh. We did the squash matches, and I think he kind of, again, did it to see if I'd stick around, because Buddy beat the hell out of me, and, like, he didn't know what he was doing. He gave me a smo and drop and killed. Um, then we did a show here. Or no, no, no. He did a show somewhere else around here. Anyways, he made me then, as more of, like, testing me to see if I wanted it, he made me be one of the wrestlers, Jimmy the Bull was his name, his number one fan. So for two shows, I had to sit in the crowd with a shirt that said Jimmy the Bull number one on it, and be that lunatic fan. Like, you see them at every show. Yeah, yeah. Standing up, hollering, like, the whole nine yards. And then <clears throat> this guy was in a championship match. And at the end of it, uh, the guy he was working that night went for an elbow drop, which was his finisher. I ran into the ring, gave Buddy the flare bump, and Jimmy the Bull won. And then I got thrown into the mix, I guess, from there. Uh, we did a couple tag matches, which actually ended up being Troy's tag partner. And I think we only did two matches, and then Murph said to me, he was like, he had a reputation back in the day, from what I understand. Oh. He broke in through a backyard, or yeah. like, he always got, great dude, he had a wicked body, still does those days, yeah. like 40, did a show for us last year, and he was like the he, best looking He guy. was booked, Not and this isn't a knock on him, he was booked solely because of how he looked. Not, not because of his ability. He had one of the, like he had, I said, that's not a knock. A lot no. of all the guys in the ring, he looked like a million bucks. Well, he was tanned. He yeah. was jacked. He had wicked gear. Yeah. Um, and I remember he said to me, he said, uh, "I don't want you to go through. I don't want you to have the kind of name that I do." He was like, "So I'm going to put you in contact with Gary Williams." And that's when Gary had the training center and the garage in Spryfield. Yep. Yeah. And so I got in contact with Gary, and it would have been May of 2000. Six, and then he started another class in August or September of that year, mm -hmm. and it was me, Jeremy Cross, Norman Ross, and Ryan uh, Dodge. No, uh, it was another bigger set guy, same build as me. He had black curly hair, very polite. He didn't stick around. I was gonna say he's not so. Uh, he did most of the training. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter. He didn't do any matches, but in him, and yeah, I went to Gary's school for. I'd say it was likely three or four months on weekends. Yeah, that's what they were, yeah? Yeah, three or four months. Uh, to Tony Armstrong was the main instructor for my class. Yeah. Gary was there, but he lived in Moncton at the time, so he wasn't able to commute up every weekend because, I mean, obviously it's unreal the price to go back and forth. Right. But, I mean, he was likely there two times a month, I would say. Um, it was it was hard. Like, I, I now, and this isn't a knock to Tony, now that I've trained with Mike Hughes, it's really different. ten times like Gary's training wasn't easy, but it wasn't hard. It's like the first time I trained with Mike, I puked. Yeah, I literally had, to, and we didn't even like do anything. He just blew me up within an hour. And this is just a difference of experience. Like Tony probably should shouldn't have been training people, right? Tony knew the basics really well, but Mike had is different. Like yeah, yeah. experience. If Gary was there all the time, it probably would have been different would have been different too, right? definitely. And I mean, like again, I can't say it wasn't. I'm not knocking in any way, shape, or form. No, it wasn't no. easy. But I remember, uh, 
I, I didn't find it overly challenging. Like I found, like I caught on to things a lot. A front bump was my easily the hardest thing I had to learn. Yeah. And that ended up uh, through the week, I still had this ring in my backyard. So one of my good friends, Brian, who actually did maybe a month of training with me. Brian McKay? Yeah, yes. the other, not the I know. New Brunswick. Yeah, he wore a mat, he wrestled Yeah, has a Ryan sometimes yeah. too. And anyways, like through the week, we'd get home from school and I would stand in the corner and he'd go in the middle and it was just hip toss, hip toss, hip toss. And finally, I got over and didn't, you know, didn't do that side roll, which is right. awful. Um, yeah, so then I just got trained by Gary and was off to the races. How did you, is that, how, how did, like, what was the first actual maritime wrestling shows you attended? Like, did you attend any before attend, you became, uh, yeah. like, not the backyard shows here? I right? used like to. Like, Real Action or Yeah, Grand I went to three, three or four Real Actions. When they, they used to go to Churro. I don't know if it was every other week. Or, it was probably every two weeks? I think so. Yeah. I used to go to a few of those shows. Like, I remember one show I went to, Chi Chi Cruz and Bobby Roode were the main event. Yep. Um, the Sinners ran in, and Gary mm -hmm. ran in, and uh, some other people. But I used to go to those shows all the time. And they used to draw in Truro. Like, now Truro doesn't overly draw. Like, yeah. they might get two to 300. But I remember, like, going to those shows, it'd be five or 600 people. They drew 1,500 people in Halifax every it's two weeks back then. Crazy. Like, it was like, insane. At Exhibition Park. It would have been awesome to be a part, like, yeah. so my generation of guys, it would have been so awesome to be in that generation, to be able to, you know, be on an actual loop of shows with great numbers and... Frig, like for me, it's like Frig, you'd have to really put the work in outside of the shows to look the part, and it was a lifestyle more so than a hobby. Yeah, in my opinion, you could have picked almost anybody off that roster and put them on television, and they wouldn't have looked at a place. No, yeah, they were all. Yeah, King, yeah, yeah. Brody Steele, you had Mike Hughes, yeah. you had Bobby Roode, who's going to wrestle on WrestleMania in a couple weeks. Yeah, like it's you crazy. had uh, Kurgan, who was just off of WWE television. Yeah. Like, and even the lower guys, like custom made, not lower in talent, but just like the smaller guys, yeah. custom made man, Flesh Gordon, they all like looked. looked they were the all part. The part. They, that, and that's the. It difference. was believable. They yeah, came out and they didn't 100%. have to sell themselves to get over they just got over they because of like their look right? yeah. um i went to a few grand prix shows not as many because they weren't by the time i was interested i don't think they were running as much like i went to a tatamaga show right. um and gary and duke were on it marco like estrada was on that's it. 2005 yeah 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 marco estrada was on it uh jeff dupree <laughs> evil <Spider -Man>. Eddie, yeah <laughs> um but yeah that would have been likely all that i went to local the wwf show in halifax and right. stuff like that you got trained, um, and how did you go about getting booked on your first set of shows? What were your first actual matches like? So, after I got trained, at the time, uh, so Jason Holiday, anybody that doesn't know, like between him breaking me in, he also grew up with my brothers. So I think he, without me knowing at the time, had been a soft spot for, for me. Right. And like even to this day, I kind of view him as a big brother. Like he just kind of helped me out yeah. with my passion. Um, so after I got trained, he was working down in Maine. A lot with Sonny Roselli, Larry Huntley. In the back of the restaurant. Dino's. Yeah, Dino's. <laughs> You've been there. Oh, yeah. Awesome with the low ceiling. Yeah. So he, as soon as I got trained, he was like, hey, I can get you booked. There were, they did three shows Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which Sunday was in the pizza joint. <laughs> and we went down. The first match I had trained was me and Murph against Jason Rumble and is his name Eric Atlas? He wrestles for Chittick. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he goes by something different now. Uh, 400, they are advertisements, 425 pounds. Eric Johnson. Now. Yes, yeah. that's him. So that was my first match. Um, the next night, uh, I don't know how I remember this all. The next night I worked Sonny Roselli, and I remember that because he called a spot for a back elbow. And, and at the time I was 325 pounds, and when he gave me the back elbow, I legit did a backflip, and all I was trying to do was bump. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the third night I worked another guy, Chase San Antone, who's like a. Chris. Chris, Chris no. Santo? Short little bald he's fat short, guy? He's short, fat, I don't think bald. No. Um, I can't remember if he was bald. He, was bald he played man. like a country, like he came out to the country music, he had chaps on. He never worked very much down there. Yeah. Um, there was a guy named Chris Santo. Chris, it might have been him, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I went back again and did two more shows. Me and Murph worked one night and then uh, I had like my initiation. I never knew. I guess Larry Huntley has a reputation with new guys. <laughs> so they did me and Murph against. Chops what's that? He chops them? Chops? Yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> dude. So I love. I don't love you, Larry. But anyways, um, it was me and Murph against Mark Moment. 
Oh, yeah. And I love Larry, the moment. Uh, he's Except the on character. His floor. Same. Yeah. And uh, so we did this dog collar tag match. So I think this went on without me knowing. It was Murph was attached to Mark Moment. I was attached to Larry. And it was like a tornado tag kind of rules. And the loser had to eat dog food. So me and Murph were scheduled to lose. And backstage, they switched the dog food can, like the label, with, like, I don't know, stew. We went out for the match, they switched it back so it was legit dog food. Anyways, during the match, and it's just because I was a new guy, dude, I, I had acne here, and like Larry was literally like squeezing at my acne. He put me in the corner, he wrapped the chain around his hand, chopped me likely six, seven times with the chain, gave me a snapmare, and I had hair at the time, unlike now, as you can see, <laughs> grabbed me by my hair, wrapped the chain around my forehead, and gave me an overhand chop right across the face, like just. <sighs> Beat me up, um, but I don't hold it against him. Like I get it. I get that whole. Like why would I hold it against him? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just. It's not like he was trying to like literally kick my ass, but he did in a wrestling way. Right. Um, so we lost. Uh, Chris Hamrick was on that show. So it was Honky Tonk Man, yeah. and everybody got a laugh because me and Murph at the end had to be on our knees and they fed us what we thought was going to be beef stew, but it turned out to be dog food. <laughs> it's kind of gross. Um, then when I got back here to the Maritimes, I remember I worked with Chittick one time in Trenton as Cold Hard Cash okay. against that Eric Johnson, Johnson guy yep. again. Um, and then from there, like, I don't know, there was back then, and I don't mean this again as a knock, I guess I sound like a hatred guy, but there was like a, a click in Halifax, not a click, but it was like, there was uh, Tommy, what's his name? Jeff. Hot Jeff, Osborne. yeah, like yeah. they were all good. There was, there was a group of them. The guy, basically, it was everybody in Gary's school yeah. for the first two classes. Yeah. And I remember I was like, oh, they're they're good. They were at that next level. Yeah. And I think it was like part of me kind of being discouraged. I was like, Frank, these guys are getting booked everywhere. Frank, what am I going to do? And so at the time, this was not likely the right decision, but I was like, took a step backwards. And I had my group of guys that I was like backyarders with. And we started renting this hall. I got the ring off of Jason, did a bunch of changes, and then we ran into Burt Legion for two years. Right. And like back then, it sounds weird, but like it's not a lot, but it's like we used to always get between two to 250, yeah. and we had storylines that were like, yes, over the top, and like this day and age, I think you you wouldn't see them on indie shows, like around here anyways, like it was totally against the tradi tradition of wrestling, but it worked. Like we always got 200, 250 people. Uh, it wasn't done right by like business standards because like at the end of the night it'd just be like open the cash box and split it amongst however many guys were there but it helped when it, if there was ever not a draw do you know what I mean like yeah, it wasn't yeah, you didn't have to worry about going broke yeah. but it, it went good and then randomly Sheldon McLean reached out to me in 2007 or 8 and asked me to be on an ECPW show which man when you're only doing shows at the Legion and Domain and all of a sudden like at the time ECPW was the top promotion in yeah. Atlanta Canada and I was like sure and I went up there I worked Peter Smith was that your I, first show were you for ECPW when you were yeah that would have been my first okay that, that was like June 2008 yeah you're good yeah. <laughs> or yeah yeah it would have been June it was the one with like Joey Mercury and uh, yes and uh, Eugene I think was on the, no Rhino Eugene right one of them. Joey Mercury was on it because he worked Titus. Titus yeah. And Cat Power worked Daniel. Yep. And yep. then I, I forget who Mike worked that night. He was the champion. It was either Eugene or Rhino. I can't remember. Which I think one. it was Eugene. Yeah. And then, so I worked that show and worked Peter, which I was nervous, like as anybody <laughs> knew would be or still would is today. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you could ask him how the match went. All I knew was I just listened and yeah. bumped. Uh, yeah, and then it was kind of off to the races from there. Like, so that that's how you got in with like Mike. And Pete, yeah, that's and that where I would have met them. Was through there. Yeah. How did you go? Um, okay, you you were trained in like 2006, 2007. 2006. Yeah. There was a lot of big shows. That was kind of a hot time in in the Nova Scotia well, region. That's when Chuck started up. Uh, likely the next year, 08. 08 was when Chuck did yeah. it. But there was like the Maritime Cup, and then there was the Wrestling Reality Show, and then there was the Wrestling Reality Tour. Now you weren't used on any of that. No. Did you think, did you want to be a part of that? Uh, did you try to be a part of that? I didn't have, I didn't know anybody then. Like when that tour went on, would have been when I was doing the shows here. So I never met Mike or Peter or any of those guys at that time. Yep. Um, I remember watching it. Like I actually remember asking my parents to get the Fight Network just so I could watch it. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, like 
No, definitely. I, it never even went through my head. I knew that some. I know Troy was on it, and he was doing Ring Crew. Yeah. Oh yeah. For some of the shows. I don't know if he, he did all. He he was on Ring Crew. Yeah. He, he didn't work any of the shows. Okay, but there was no. I just knew. I was like, I'm not even. I had, I had no matches at the time, really. Right. Maybe six. Yeah, there was a lot of like uh, Troy wasn't booked. Uh, Chris Madison wasn't booked. Those were all like Gary's students. Yeah. It was so then Chuck started up in 2008 yeah. with Mike Hughes. They were I don't know if they were co-promoting, but it was I never it, did it, it was Mike's ring. Uh, Mike made that ring. He anyway. made the UCW one, yeah. Yeah, and, and they did the PEI did, show with Honky. Yeah, I wasn't on any of that. Um, when did you start working with Chuck and those guys? I don't know. I can't remember how that worked out. I think Frank. I think Chuck came to a few of our shows here yep. because I remember like talking to Troy. Me and Troy, we go back to 2004, 2005, and excuse me, I remember trying to get him to come do the New Breed shows, but he d didn't for a while because he's worried you get heat because of working with backyarders. Right. But then he seen that, yes, they were backyarders, but I had guys that looked at the part. There were some guys that were decent for that time era. They Well, they were good for that time era. Um, and then eventually he came over, and so then Chuck heard about these shows, and he came down, and I remember talking to him, and he just asked me, he's like, hey, we're doing a show in Spryfield, do you want to come up? And I was, most certainly. Uh, first time in Spryfield, I tagged with Alexander Saint against, uh, Rector's his real name, uh, shaved the R on his back. Rebel. Rebel, yes. <laughs> Rebel and Haggerty. Uh, and I think we did like two shows, and then, and both those shows, Mike and Pete were on those yep. as well. And yeah, I, that's how I would have, I guess, got to know Mike a little bit better. Pete, I kind of avoided back then because I, I knew. Scared. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody was. <laughs> uh, everybody still is. Um, you, I remember there was a show where you main evented at the Four Multi Purpose Center against yeah. Titus. I, I think it was for the first UCW championship. Yeah. Uh, I believe you're right. Yeah. Because he yeah. chucked it a tournament yeah. where the show's leading up to determined who was going to work Titus yeah. and he ended up pushing me to win that match and then I ended up working Titus and man back then I was terrified yeah. I was terrified I was like I don't know what I'm doing I remember Titus wanted to do the Spanish fly and I was like I uh, luckily Mike heard it and Mike was like <laughs> just do the Herc run off the top for a finish thank you Mike <laughs> um, yeah that was fun it was I forget what the crowd was like that night like it was pretty good was it decent the, they always drew decent like back in those days at the, at it was the still hot center yeah it was still yeah. really good Chuck used to bring in a lot of names back then I don't know if Marty Gennetti was here for those shows but not yet not I think yet. he was more 2010 okay yeah yeah it, they all like blur together I can't remember which was when <laughs> but it was fun like I, yeah. I used to have a blast like uh, that's when Chuck used to do like Kentville and Liverpool and yeah. Bridgewater and it was a fun tour. Like he did Bible Hill one time. Bible Hill drew awesome when he had Al Snow and Honky and Luke in. Yeah. Um, he ran the form too with that. I think that was the same. Troy. Loop. Oh, that was the same. Same loop. loop. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so then I worked with Chuck until 2011, I'd say, and then uh, two shows again in 2013 for him. Um, I picked up a lot of work in 2010 from Devin. Devin did uh, like Windsor. You were there oh, yeah. when he had the guys from the states come up. Yeah. Uh, you worked Mike. And Mike tried to throw a drop kick in that match. Do you remember that? He tried. Yeah. <laughs> he drop kicked my knee. Um, but yeah, like I did those shows. Uh, literally just local stuff. I went to Newfoundland a few times. You did Doolittle's a few times. Uh, did you Doolittle's. Yes. You worked. Yes. I remember those. B guys. Machine was there. I worked him one night and Earl Cooper. I was gonna say I was there. You worked. I think I was there for both of those. But back when those. Uh, like um, I forget the German's name. Uh, uh, Joseph von Schmidt. Yeah, and, and Cooter and Grimes was up for those shows. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You did the Bret Hart exhibition show yep. too. Yeah. What, what do you remember of that? Uh, that was awesome. I remember at the time I was like, this is it felt larger than life. It was the first time I was ever in the ex exhibition ground. Ex it was What's Exhibition Park back exhibition then. Exhibition Park. I don't yeah. know what it's called. No, it's something else. Um, I remember this first time I was there and like just through hearing stories from the. You know, that's, where vets, action, that's where real action yeah. went. So I was like, this is cool. And like, just that venue has an awesome atmosphere. Um, the whole day of the expo was surreal. Like, there was 2,300 people. Is that what ended up? Th throughout the day, there was like close to 3,000 that came for the autograph uh, signings yeah. and stuff. But I think that actually stayed for the wrestling. There was like 800, right. which is still a ton. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah. But they, it would have looked better if they set it up the way real action set it up. Which How is real, uh, for the ex for the Bret Hart show? They had the ring in the very center yes. for real action. They cut it off, 
so oh, that okay. you would, and they had a giant black curtain. So you're at the blue line. It. You're at the blue line instead of center. Instead of center right. Gotcha. So that okay. way, yeah. it would have been packed. There would have been no empty seats, right? And it would have looked so been much better. better. But I mean, hey, it was a good show. I mean, I'm sure he was very successful with it. Um, that was fun. Uh, yeah, and did some work over in Newfoundland. Mike got me booked over there. Started in 2010 with I Legend think. City. Yeah, with Legend City it was Dan and Clark at the time. That was a blast. Like I would have to say, I never had any. I never had a very big. Uh, career as far as like travel wise it was pretty much just Atlantic Canada and Maine but I loved going to Newfoundland just the environment over there the crowds were awesome everybody that got booked over there was so fun to be around and it, you just you always look forward to who you were going to work is that something that you just weren't interested in or are you interested in like going overseas and wrestling or down uh, to Rico and stuff? not now when between the ages of 20 and 24, 25, definitely, I would have loved to. But Did I you just, just not pursue it? I didn't, I think it was more, I was too nervous, right. too nervous, scared, whatever you want to call it. I was like, this is a long ways from home. Like I was, I think I was just worried about going over and getting chewed up, and yeah. spit out kind of thing. Right. But I mean, I don't know, it would have been, I'm jealous of like, when you see Titus went over and Burke went over and Troy goes over and it's like, you see the success they have and it's like, oh, that looks awesome. Yeah. I just never did it and now I'm not really at a place where I could, right? right? But yeah. And back in 010, you, the fourth Maritime Cup was in uh, yeah. Stratford yep. PEI. Uh, you went over in that tournament. Yeah. Uh, what did that mean to that you? That was awesome. Like, that's not like a mark. <laughs> when I'm looking at the trophy and has Bobby Roode's name on it, I was like, awesome. This is, this, I like, again, I know everything's a work, but it was more like meaningful maybe than right. the championship. Yep. Because, you know, there's Bobby Roode, Peter, Titus, and then me. Yep. And I think that's it. That's Still it. to this day. <laughs> eight years. There hasn't been one new Scott. 2037 Oops. is the next one. All right. <laughs> I'll only be like 50. Book me. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> 49 actually and then a couple years after that uh, now Red Rock Wrestling is in my opinion draws the uh, most consistent people, most consistent people at yeah. their shows of anybody yeah, in the country it's, it, I mean I don't think it's an opinion I think it's fact they draw the, the largest crowds the most definitely. amount of times uh, in Stratford PEI you Mike Hughes yep. uh, you are the is the promoter you are the Red Rock Wrestling Champion yep. for a time well, twice what, tw oh, yeah, twice, yeah, twice. Right? What, what did that mean uh, it was awesome like to know that Mike had trust in me to be the you know the top guy of his promotion for a period of time knowing how it's different in PEI and I know this sounds very stereotyped because you've likely heard it before the way that wrestling is looked at over there is a lot different than even when I lived in Nova Scotia like I would, yeah like I tell people oh I wrestle here and people not that they don't take it seriously but they're just kind of like oh yeah it's fake yeah. or oh yeah blah blah haha ha. but over there like I went I went to Hunter's the other day and just randomly 15% off VIP and I was like what like why did I get that yeah. but over there it's so Mike's really respected on the island. He does a lot of charity work. He's the work. king of PEI. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> like, it's funny, but then, like, you go somewhere and it's like somebody's putting Mike over, and you're like, what? Why? Like, <laughs> literally, I came to get food, and now I have to hear Mike's story. And I'm like, <laughs> the hell? I give it, I razz him all the time about it. Like, just, anyways, what I was getting at is how the view on it over there, it's looked at something so positive between the charities that they give back to and the community involvement. Um, it's, I don't know, it just, it's looked at as being extremely legit and like all his sponsors are legit the big name yeah. local businesses over there and this isn't a knock to any other promotion by no means but it just it's so community oriented yeah. or oriented that's not right either whatever um, <laughs> but yeah so going back to the question it was it was awesome like uh, you know to go over and be able to be hold the title for a period of time and I mostly worked with Mike which I'd have to say he'd be and this isn't like I'm not trying to like put him over he would be my favorite guy to work it just he brings out something in me that I, it's almost like when I work with him I feel like I need to bring it up a notch and perform at a different level yeah. and he's a great leader as far as like being in the ring he can really lead you around that was my favorite guy to watch yeah like, like he just he has like an it factor um, but yeah, like it was a blast. I love to this day working Red Rock shows. Russell Center yep. ran for two, three years. They ran some really big shows. You were scheduled to be on some of those shows. I refed some of them. Your name was on the sheet yep. in the back to be there, but you weren't there. Uh, no, what, what I 
So I was originally booked on their first show um, to work with Nick Diggs, and I think what it was, I I just didn't like the angle at all they were putting over. It had something to do with being like, I don't know, like almost like a sexual predator. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like it was just. They pitched that to a few guys. I think I forget who ended up getting it. I think Troy was offered the same, he but he was. declined. Yeah. And I was just like, no, like I'll do whatever. Like yeah. what? Like you know, you've likely seen some video footages of matches, street fight I had where something went in my mouth that sounds awful. <laughs> but there was just, I just didn't want to do it. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. So I canceled that booking, and that one was well in advance. I think I canceled likely a month ahead of time. The next time they booked me was on a string of shows for Halifax and Kenville. And I remember talking back and forth with the promoter and like the pay, but basically I figured it out by the time I paid the bridge and got over the eye, over from PEI, it was all out of pocket from the bridge to Halifax to Kentville to home. That was like, it was a low ball offer of pay. Right. And I was like, that makes no sense. Two days away from home. That's my weekend. Plus at that point, like I likely have the smallest ego and the smallest little bit of confidence ever. So I'm not trying to act like a big leaguer. At that point, I knew what I could bring to the roster. Yep. I knew I could perform in a match, say with Titus, at Titus's level or at a Burke level, not now, but at that point. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I'd be able 100%. to do that. I was pumped that you were coming because a lot of that roster was super young. Didn't have it was a lot, a lot of smaller matches. guys. So I was yeah. like, okay. You're and a then, big dude, you're like 6'4"? Six, 6'5". Six, five. Six, five. Six, five. <laughs> and I mean, at that point in time, like I'm not like, I'm not in good shape right now, but I mean, at that point I was likely 245. Right. I had a really physical job, so I was able, I cut down a lot of body fat and I was like, no, like I literally, for what they offered me, I was getting paid three times the amount from Mike right. to work in my backyard essentially. <laughs> and then their offer to go over for two shows, I was like, I love wrestling, but not at that expense. No, I don't want to I don't, it's, it's, no, it's, it's, I don't want to lose money. I didn't know the guy. So I mean, like, you know, sometimes with friends in this business, you work out deals, right. but I, I didn't know him. I don't think I've ever to this day met Jason Mosier. He, oh no, I did. But he yes. used to film for Chuck years ago. Years ago, yeah. yeah. So I just that day I was like, I remember ta I messaged him and I was like, man, can we figure out something on this pay? And he was like, no. He had me scheduled to work James Smith, and I was like, well, I hate to be a dick, and maybe I got a bad reputation because of it, but I was like, I, I can't justify that. Right. I can't justify paying all that expense out of my pocket. And you know, I wish I had it done the rest of the center shows because back to like how I said I love being in front of a crowd. Yeah. Their crowd, I loved how it was adults. It seemed more adult based. They're out drinking, having a good time. They were really interactive with the show. Yeah. Too. So like that part, I, I was jealous. I used to watch all the Russell Center stuff because I was like, that looks like a good time. Just unfortunately, I couldn't be part of it. Yeah. So. Now, who in your in your opinion is the best wrestler in the Maritimes today? Today? Wow, that's hard. Um, Frick, I have it. I can narrow it down to three. That's fine. That's about it. Yeah. I would say. I know this comes up a lot. Mike, Pete, and Burke would be my answers. Like. I, I watch, I, I'm i that guy that I watch all the shows I'm not on. As soon as you or Mike Miles puts a video on, dude, I watch the entire show. Uh, Burke's matches, he's phenomenal. He never misses a beat. He's over as over gets. Um, Pete, he's, you can't replace Pete. All right. He's well, one of a kind. It's so sad that he's not around anymore. Yeah, like, like crushed. I, I, like, I love being in You need before. that veteran in the locker room. Oh, there's definitely. none. Not knocking anybody no. here tonight, but there's no Peter Smith. There's no Mike Hughes. You need someone to lead. And there's nobody shit, to really right? replace what they brought. Absolutely not. In my like, opinion. Yeah. And then Mike, Mike's good face or heel. You know, yeah. he can get over us both. So I would narrow it down to those three. Yeah. Um, if you could put one match of yours on a DVD to show somebody what you do, what match would you choose? Uh, you know what, I had a match in 2011 with Robbie McAllister and it was in Marysville, Newfoundland, or Marystown, Newfoundland, and that would likely be the match. I remember it was one of the first times I met him and uh, <laughs> kind of like an insider story. Me and Troy were traveling that day together and we were a little under the weather and <laughs> We were, we were both saying, like, fuck, sorry to swear. I was like, Brad, fuck, well, I hope we don't have to work Robbie tonight. Because Robbie, at that point, he was going, man. Like, yeah, he was, I, I filmed a bunch of his matches. And yeah, he was time. never lazy. No. He just went. <laughs> yeah. And then I remember we got to the building. We were standing outside, and Clarky was giving the card. And he's like, Cook, you're working Robbie. And I was like, yep. And in my head, I was like, fuck. 
but man he didn't want to go over very much he was like let's call it out there I was green as can be and it was awesome I think we did like a 25 minute match you have it uh, Tyson gave you the tapes and you actually uploaded oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was on there yeah. that would be one that it was very it was the basics it wasn't like the main event style crazy match but just for being basics I, I loved it and he was really happy about it which you know I was like well hell this guy's been WWE he's yeah. been successful he's happy with the match awesome it's funny in 2003 I filmed the backyard show that both Highlanders and Ty Dillinger now who was Sean Spears at the time Where did that at? in Dartmouth Nova Scotia <laughs> in a hockey rink where the fans had to bring their own chairs because there was no chairs That's in, awesome. in the building but looking <laughs> back they were I can't remember if it was just before they were in WWE or just after, but Sean Spears. Because they would have started like 04-05, wouldn't they? This was, uh, yeah, I think so. So it would have been just before. Yeah. But it's so weird seeing Ty Dillinger on television now, and he wrestled as like a, I don't know, he was in like a pirate shirt or something back wow. then. Was, I you would the, never I think he'd get to where he is. Online. Like, no idea who he was back then. I like, and now he's up. like, gets a huge reaction when he comes out. You're like, well, how did that work out for you? But yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on the support the fans give Maritime Wrestling? It's crazy, man. They, uh, the thing about these fans, and I have a small sample size, like I said, I only went to Maine. Oh, I wrestled in Ontario once or twice. Uh, they're, they get invested. Like, they actually, for the most part, most towns, they get extremely invested. And now, I'm not on as, I'm not on as many shows as I it's used to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's only Andre. Um, I'm not on as many shows as I used to be. But is that by choice? Yeah. yeah. Um, it seems like now you have fans that they literally they travel. That no longer like now a fan from Halifax has no problem going to Moncton. Yeah. And vice versa. And it's like, it's dude, crazy, that's a three hour drive, a yeah. three and a half, whatever it would work out to Gas ain't cheap. No, and then they pay the price of admission and they stay and yeah. it's and you, you gotta love fans like that because to new fans it helps the new fans learn or it helps, you know what I mean? Who's good, who's bad, uh, who just just that I guess. It, it's a cool scene. Like the support they give and I mean, especially with the merch. I know through talking to the guys, some of the guys have awesome merch yeah. sales. Like it, it just around here I find it might go back to like Grand Prix, I'm sure it does, is that it's almost like a family tradition for some people because yeah. it's this conversation they can have with their grandfather who used to go to all the Grand Prix shows and he'll talk about Cuban Assassin, Leo yeah. Burke, all those guys and I think that's likely what it is. We had such a booming area for our parents and grandparents and relatable maybe. Yeah. That's kind of a deep answer. But. <laughs> if the WWE Performance Center was around when you started wrestling, yeah. is that an avenue would, you would have chosen to try and go to? It's all like they call you for trials yeah. and stuff, but is that something you, you would have tried to do? I think so. I mean, you know, I'm just saying, sure. But <laughs> yeah, because it would have been like, I remember asking people, and this is before I met people that actually knew how to go about it, but yeah. I remember being like, how do you do that? Do you send an email? Like, how do you contact these people? I remember being like 18 years old and I got a number from somebody and I called and just like a receptionist answered and said, email this person and hung up. Like they want to get you off the phone. I was like, ah, we used to email, or email. We used to mail physical VHS tapes to their headquarters for like Sarah and Bobby Roode used to do it. Like really? everybody, we used to mail them tapes and I guess they would show, Tommy Dreamer was the agent back then. Yeah. They would just pile up on his desk. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know. I think now where it seems like it's more not like there's more you can get more knowledge on how to get there yeah or like i think i heard this that you can actually pay for a tryout i heard that i don't know if it's true but you can pay x amount of dollars and it will only get you you know maybe a day yeah and then if they think you're capable i don't i don't know the ins and outs but i mean if that's possible like good for them i'm sure they make all kinds of money from it <laughs> and for people that have talent it's one way to go about it yeah what does the future hold for the big pitcher Chris Cook? Honestly, I've slowed down a lot. Like like you said, it's by choice. Um, just, I don't know, life's different now. I got, I'm married, I have a kid. Um, little pitcher. Little pitcher, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be bigger than me, likely. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, just a, a career outside of wrestling that I can't... I don't want to take the time away anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like to just ask for days off to go wrestle. Like I'd love to, but it's just not worth it now. I'm at a stage where I, I can't do that as easy as I could before. Um, I'm always going to work Red Rock shows. It's local. I love the scene over there. Um, I want I want to continue doing the new breed shows and hell, I'll, any show I'd like to do. But I just 
I'm so brutal that I won't take a day off work right. for a booking anymore. Well, and that costs, yeah, and yeah, it's it, different. And it costs you a lot of bookings because I mean, if there's a Friday show, which a lot of people do Friday shows now, and it's in Moncton or it's in Halifax, well, Halifax, I can't make. Halifax, I did one Friday night show and it was like putting my knee pads and my boots on in the car right. to go in and then instantly, not instantly, I likely had 10 minutes before my match started. And I mean, right. from a promoter's point of view, what if I get a flat tire? Right. Do you know what I mean? It's that I can't. Those are for TCW? No, that was IHW. IHW. There was one IHW show oh. I did. Um, I just can't guarantee that I can make it through the week. And then, I don't know, a lot of like on weekends now, like I say, I've been asked about a few shows and I just say, no, I'd rather stay home. Just, I don't know. Not that I'm losing, losing passion or anything like that. It just, again, it's... Priorities change. Yeah, that's all it is. Priorities change. If it's a Saturday and I have to leave, I feel guilty being like, to my wife, Mag, okay, see you Sunday night. I'm going to go wrestle, you know, have fun looking after our kid. Like, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just a very guilt-driven person, right. and I don't like to do that. Right. So I'm not knocking anybody that does, but it's just not for me, I guess. <laughs> Do you have any closing comments for any friends, family, or fans that might be watching this? Come out to the damn shows. You see the posters everywhere. You see it on <laughs> Facebook. You hear people all the time, when's your next show? When's your next show? They don't come. Come out <laughs> to the shows. Just give it a try once. I mean, hell, Andre will like, hook you up with tickets if you ask him. Um, yeah, just come out. Check it out. If you haven't been to a show, it's for all ages. It's good, clean entertainment. And right now, the maritime scene is crazy good. Like... It's unreal. Like, like I say, I. It's best it's been in years. It's best it's been since like the real action days. The talent might be a little different, but yeah. it's, it's catching fire again. Yeah, and like yeah. The, I don't know. Like, look at look at the numbers everywhere is doing right now. Every promotion yeah. seems to be getting high numbers with good quality talent. Like Chuck shows. You see Marco Estrada coming in, Tyson Dukes, yeah. and uh, Carter Mason. Is that his name? Yeah, he's coming to the next right? Like it seems now, there's a wider talent pool coming. So it's just getting on top of local talent. You're getting outside talent, just making it bigger and bigger and bigger and better. Yeah. So it's on. It's hard to say what the future holds, other than good things for Maritimes. Well, I'd like to thank you for doing your first, first ever interview with me. Awesome. I really appreciate it. It, it. it was an honor. And thanks oh, for your time. Thank you for including me on the new Scott interview list. <laughs>